OK, last one, but not least. So what I want to talk about today is diversity. So what is the significance of the labels that we put on ourselves? What is the significance of the labels that are put on us from society? Do they have a relationship to us in that society? And also, from my perspective, does it have a relationship to us in health and wellness or illness? So things like gender, male, female, transgender. Are we African American, Latino, Asian, Caucasian? Are we single, not man, single? Um, are we married or with a partner? Are we divorced or widowed? Are we straight or heterosexual? Are we gay? Are we lesbian? Are we bisexual or any of the other sexual minorities? Are we Muslim? Are we Jews? Are we Christians? Are we Hindus? Are we Buddhist? I speak English. Yo hablo español. Ya movi poposku. Ma Nepali bochu. Or have we been incarcerated, or are we cur currently in prison? Are we foreign born? Are we American born? These are just a few of the many labels that are put on us by society, but then we also label ourselves. Some of them are very easy and well defined. You're either married, partnered, or you're not, or you were born in the US, or you were not. But things like race, and even spiritual connection and religion, there's some, you know, there's some kind of subjectivity to that. And these issues really became an interest of mine. So I'm an infectious disease specialist. Um, I take care of people living with HIV uh, as, a, as a focus. And I got interested in working with marginalized and underserved populations of people. So you may say, well, what's that really mean? So these are populations of people that have problems accessing medical care in their society, either because of the medical system or, because, or they are able to engage with healthcare, but they can't follow because of lots of problems. So they come to the doctor once and then they disappear. We can't figure out where they are. And so they don't benefit from the healthcare service and, and for their health. And a lot of times, the challenges are bilateral. The patients face many barriers. There are lots of issues. There's other things going on in their lives. It's difficult for them. But a lot of the times, the de deficiency is in us. The deficiency is in the healthcare system. And many times, the healthcare system actually places active barriers to prevent certain populations of people from accessing medical care. These types of issues really became central to some of my interests. You may ask, well, what are different examples of these populations? So I've worked in different countries, and I've work, I work in urban settings here in Chicago, so it's a bit different. But they may be racial, ethnic, caste minorities. They may, may be non-English or non-majority speaking populations. They may be win, women because of gender inequality. They may be people who, who struggle with substance use, mental health issues people that are homeless, people that are from LGBT populations. So there's many different ways that you can look at these issues, but the reality is that these identities do have links to your health and illness that are very real. So let me take you back in time to the 1990s or so, around 1995, 1996, um, in a small suburb of a small city in Pennsylvania. It's a very homogeneous place. So, it's all white, it's all middle class, it's all Christian. Maybe there is one person of color in every year or every other year in the local high school. There's very few non-Christians, and there's really no openly LGBT people, although there's a lot of gossiping going on in the school about different teachers and people, but there's nobody who's really out there that's open about it. This is the place where I grew up. So, one of the things I remember the most about my child, what kind of my high school and middle school, was I played sports. And so we would take trips to these games for an hour or two, sit on a bus, you know, talk about whatever, you know, 16 year olds talk about. And a lot of times we faced teams that were from different backgrounds, some that were from urban settings in, in the area that we were in. And so they were different than us. And I remember distinctly words that came up words that were used, basically derogatory terms, racist terms, things I'm not gonna repeat, but you can probably imagine what they are. Um, and you know, for some people, those words came very easily, but for other people, they just allowed them to be spoken. And I think that in the context of my, my community, it was very easy for us to 
not say anything, and to label the other people as others, so anybody different than us. Because really, we had no relationship with people that were different from us. We didn't understand what's going on, and they weren't like kind of real to us. We didn't really have any way to relate, relate to them. And so it was easy for us to do that. So after I went to school, I went to college, um, where one distribution class, so like a kind of, we call it, like it's a kind of like a required distribution class, um, which ended up being in Hinduism, became an entire major in the religions of the Indian subcontinent, and by the way, biology, because I did end up going to medical school eventually. And so this was something I really knew nothing about, except for maybe this guy. Do you guys remember him? So Simpsons were very popular to me when I was growing up. And this is basically what I knew about India and that part of the world. If you don't remember him, he's Apu. He's the kind of stereotypical Indian immigrant who owns the Quickie Mart in Springfield in The Simpsons. So that's a whole discussion about what that means. Is that good that I knew something? Or is it not great that that's what I thought it was? Um, but to, to, to kind of summarize it, I didn't know very much. So I learned a lot, uh, not just because it was religion, it was kind of a very different thing than the sciences, but also I learned a lot about culture and history of a place I really didn't know anything about. So I went to college, then I went to medical school here in Chicago. So I, went to a, I came to a very diverse city, was expo exposed to more diversity, then went to India for the first time out of the first trip out of country, then to Bolivia, then to India again, then to Namibia and Southern Africa. And then after I finished my infectious disease training, I went to Nepal, where I lived for three years. And my focus there was taking care of people living with HIV. In Nepal, I experienced in my face very clearly what social marginalization was in a way that I had no concept of because of where I came from and who I was. I saw people living with HIV be completely socially isolated, subject to discrimina open discrimination in every aspect of their life, kicked out of their village, kicked out of their house, lost their job, doctors won't touch them, take care of them, um, violence against them, and then just very poor access to medical care. And the thing that one of the things that was so offensive to me was that Healthcare workers, who are supposedly the most educated people in society, sometimes, um, or at least heavily educated in terms of schooling, maybe, were no different. Physicians would send them away. We don't take patients like you. Go to this hospital. Nurses wouldn't take blood from them. They wouldn't touch them. And it was very unfortunate because, because of the chronic neglect, both from the social and cultural aspect, but also from the medical system, many of the patients became, were, came to us were so advanced in their disease when really what we could do for them was treat them like a human being, and nobody did. And this kind of environment really showed me what this kind of marginalization could really be. And it was very hard for me because I was never confronted with that and I felt alone because everyone else kind of did it. There weren't very many people that were champions for this population of patients. And it was very frustrating and, and discouraging. And some of the young people here may say, well, how is this possible? Like, we're, it's 2017, how can people be acting like this in this time, day and age? HIV is not that big of a deal. But those of you that are older can tell you that that exact same thing happened here in the 1990s. Um, and only after law and a lot of activism and other things in our society here have things changed, kind of. Because what I'll tell you is that it still exists here. I still take care of patients who face this issue. It's not in your face because it's illegal, but physicians will refer them to other people for services which they could provide, but they don't, under the guise of kind of a referral to another professional. So those types of issues happen, and in fact, in 2013, there were two cases seen by the Department of Justice about patients in the United States who were refused health care. One doctor actually, the patient said, the doctor actually said to them, I don't take care of patients like you. So this still exists, and so you don't have to go to some other place, but it's actually something that we see. And to me, HIV was kind of a form, an expression of a type of identity that the patient had. Sure, there was medical issues. They have a positive antibody test, blah, 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 blah. But within the context of society, there were implications of being HIV positive that affected them, just like there was aspects of them being a Dalit or an untouchable 
or being in a, a non-Nepali speaking language person, or a woman, or a transgender. So to me, I saw it kind of in that way, and I wanted to just take a second to explain it in this way. So this is an example of how HIV stigma affects people living with HIV anywhere. And I wanted to explain it because I think this is an example that really relates to all these types of identity because it's complicated. It's not just about medicine, it's about the social and cultural aspects. So people with HIV or people that are parts of different risk groups like um, sex workers, sexual minorities, people that have substance use issues, or even just women because there's such huge gender inequality issues in many parts of the world, they all are subject to stigma. And for some of these risk groups, like for women, for instance, it's like what people would say, it's like it's double stigma, Dr. Andrew. It's not just that I have HIV, but I'm a woman. How am I supposed to deal with this with both of those things? And so people would say it's like double and triple discrimination because of these issues. So they're subjected to stigma within society. This creates vulnerability to violence, to isolation, to, sti to um, stigmatization, discrimination in everything. I heard it all. Every kind of discrimination you can think of was possible. And also poor access to health services. And not just poor access, but poor health care. They had poor, when they did finally see someone that could see them, they weren't even providing really the minimum. So the actual quality of their health care is poor. This, all these societal things can then contribute to poor emotional and psychological well-being, then can predispose them to further risky behaviors that then again predisposes them to other risk factors. They become marginalized socially, economically, legally, and this can all relate to poverty because they lose their job and other things, and then ultimately poor health. For me, this isn't the example with HIV because HIV is close to my heart. Those are the patients I take care of. But all these other kinds of ideas about identity, I think are very similar. The circles may be filled in with a little bit different words and the pathways may be a little bit different, but it's complicated. It issue, it's with cultural, social, all these different issues are there. And the thing about it is, is it's not about just the identity in society today, it's also about the past and acknowledging the historical issues that come with these identities. So for instance, um, there's this. So I don't know if any of you recognize this picture. This is a picture of, oops, of the Tuskegee experiments, which were a public health uh, initiative that was um, sponsored by the federal government in the 1930s to 1970s, in which African-American men in the South who had syphilis, which is a chronic disease that has, you know, in the long term has very debilitating side, of, uh, side effects and can be actually lethal at the end, um, they were basically followed to see what happens when you're not treated for syphilis. So even though this, the penicillin was discovered in the 1940s, they weren't given penicillin, so we could study what happens. This type of issue is still in the mind of patients of mine from the south side of Chicago that I take care of, of a certain generation, of why they look at me and kind of are like, hmm, okay, and it takes time. There's trust, there's other things that are there. And it's because we have to understand the roots of these issues. So the identity issues are so complicated. It's not just about the kind of graph of issues going on now, but it's also about what's happened before and where the, that, because that, that, um, that affects people's collective understanding, not just themselves pass from generation to generation, but also the communities. The other thing that's interesting is that there's bias that happens. Bias related to these ideas of identity. So there's things like explicit and implicit bias. So explicit bias is very easy to understand. Explicit bias is a bias that you have, or someone has, that's consciously there. You know it, you don't like green things, or you like yellow, or whatever. It's very clear to you, it's conscious. So for instance, during that same period of time, this is an example of explicit bias. This was a sign in Detroit, Michigan in the 1940s from a white community saying basically, we don't want anybody but white people here. This is a white community, we don't want any of you other people. This is a clear public display of explicit bias. Now you may say again, well, that's back then, but I think all of you know that's not really what's going on because you watch the news and listen to what people are saying. And really now, it's just being replaced by a different message to another group of people. This is a modern example in 2017 of explicit bias directed towards a certain group of people in our 
country. So these things are not new, and I don't think that they're going to go away. But I think it's important for us to understand these things. And what's interesting is it's not just about explicit bias. It's also about implicit bias. Implicit bias is bias that affects our judgment and behavior, but we don't consciously recognize it's there. And there's very interesting studies in healthcare about this because it's found, been found that implicit bias affects our, our behavior, not just the practitioner, but also the patient. And when the relationship between the two is so important, that is a really big issue. So this was a study that was in 2010 of first-year medical students. And it looked at their implicit and explicit bias against gay and lesbian individuals. And the interesting thing is that no matter what they said as far as if they have explicit or implicit bias, this barred line is their level of implicit bias. So it was the same. Regardless of if you were conscious of that bias or not, very similarly, they had similar bias. And so the idea is that how do we understand these biases? And the reality is, from my perspective, I think of this from a medical standpoint, but this is a societal issue. This is about all of us and how we interact with each other. Because after all, healthcare is made done by people, people that have biases. We have, and sometimes there's systems of injustice but also the individuals, like physicians, are in a position where they can block and access and allow different accesses to services, healthcare, and all sorts of things. And so these types of biases are very important. So I feel lucky, in a way, because I've been able to work in a position with communities where I feel like I can try to work with these issues. I can serve communities that deal with these issues and there's disparities. And I also find, I've learned the, the power of teaching medical students, residents, fellows, because they will be the future of our healthcare system. And a lot of these issues like bias, you have to be conscious of. The first step is being conscious of it and then you can understand Oh, you know, it was weird. I was busy and I made I did this thing, but maybe that was weird. maybe that was kind of off. Why did I do that? But I think that the issues of identity and and diversity that I talked about today have a larger context because a lot of these issues I think of from a medical context but are really a societal issue. And I think that those issues are very important because what do we think about diversity? I mean, list turn on the TV and listen to what people have been saying for the last 6 or 8 months or whatever. Do we believe that diversity and identity is a positive thing in our society? Or do we believe that this is something that separates each other? And how are we gonna deal with these things? And I think that the question really is to you. You are part of this society and this, this country as well. What do you think about diversity and identity? Do you think that diversity and identity and, and those types of issues are something that we should, that strengthen us, that, that really, bind us together as humans because in the end, seeing across diversity is about seeing our collective humanity. Or is it just something that will accentuate our differences from one another? Okay, I'm done.